When I first started designing HTTP APIs and standalone clients like single page applications and mobile apps, I wanted to express to the clients at runtime what type of actions they could perform to have a better user experience. So for example, let's say we have a product in a warehouse and we have an HTTP API that allows us to mark that product as being available or unavailable for sale. Well, what are the business rules around that? Does the user even have the proper permissions to perform any of these actions? I only want my client application to show the relevant UI elements if the user can actually perform the action and if the system is in the proper state. So how do we actually accomplish this? Well, I'm gonna explain how we used to do things before modern HTTP APIs and how applying these simple ideas can make your clients smarter. Hey everybody, it's Derek Comartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. All right, so let's jump back 20 years when I started. And if you kind of are relate to this, well, it's probably some nostalgia. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, a little bit of a history lesson here. So initially when I started writing web apps, really your client was the browser and what you were serving to the client was HTML. Now this could be in the form of just, you have a static HTML file living on your web server and maybe it has some form in it, for example, that will then do a post to something in your CGI bin, maybe it's a Perl script, and then that data is added to a database. And then that, as things have evolved, um, maybe you started doing more server side uh, of, instead of having a static HTML, you're actually serving dynamic HTML like server side rendering. You could think then things like MVC started coming out. And then as the browser had the capabilities of doing the XML HTTP request, then things like Ajax got evolved, then jQuery, then now moved to where we are with say single page applications. The key difference here is that initially, and on this is what I'm gonna talk about, is that the client was the browser and the format that we were sending it was HTML and the browser understands HTML. Where we are right now is we're generally serving, say JSON, for example, uh, to our clients. Our clients are specifically doing the uh, HTTP requests to the server. Yes, you're still living in the browser, but the browser is kind of just the host. Your application, you're deciding which HTTP requests to actually make to the server. So the biggest distinction for me is what happened is we went from pure runtime and having the browser understand everything at runtime and we shifted heavily to design time. And what I mean by that is with things like open API, we can define what our, our HTTP API is. You can see what all the different routes are available to you, what the responses could be, the different status codes. It's great, it's a specification, no, no issues there. But the issue it, with it is that it forces you to be in design time mode, meaning that when you're writing your client, when you're writing your spa, or your mobile app, you need that specification to understand all the different actions, all the different routes, everything that you can actually do with that HTTP API. So what ultimately ends up happening is we're pushing more and more logic to the client. It exists on the server, but we have to imply it in some way to the client to make them realize if you wanna make some UI that is um, very revolve around the state of the system, like I mentioned, do you wanna be able to let the user show the user some action that they go and then try to do, then you have to show them an error message because a 400 came back. You would probably much prefer to just not let them do the action altogether if you know that they can't. But how do you know that they can't perform some action? All the source code for the demo I'm about to show is available to my developer level members on my Code Opinion channel. If you're interested in joining, go to my channel, click the join button for more information. So I'm looking at a static HTML page. There's no JavaScript. And right here I have this little form with a name in the description and then this submit button. If I look at the static HTML, here's my form. And this is what my server is sending to the client. The client being my browser, this is the content it's providing. The client, the browser, understands what to do with this. It's providing me, the user at the end here, uh, a way to actually submit that form. If I enter, I'm able to enter stuff into the name and description. And when I hit the save button, my client, the browser, is gonna make that HTTP request. There's nothing special about this, obviously, but it's the fact that it understands HTML and it understands what to do automatically with it. All right, so to point out something else that's really simple is this link here. If I click on this link, it's bringing me to a separate uh, resource here, a separate page that I have for just showing some images. If I look at the uh, HTML, yes, it's a link. There's nothing special about that. 
But the fact is, is that when we're doing this rendering from the server, we're generating this HTML and we're sending it down to the browser, we're telling the client, the browser, things that it can do. The form was something that the user could do. The link is something you can do. You can click it. We're saying here's some more information that relates to this resource. When we're thinking about uh, our APIs in this way, when we're turning JSON or something, we're seemingly never doing this. We're never telling the client what other things it can do. So now I'm thinking about my HTTP API and how does that relate? Well, typically what you'd look at, here's my catalog and I have a get request, the catalog products, which is, let's say the equivalent to what was displayed in that form. And we're gonna try it out. I'm going to call ABC123, execute, look at the result. And my result is what you would expect. It has the SKU, the name, and the description. But how does this differ from the HTML that I was showing? It's just a different representation, but I have no way here of knowing how do I update the actual product? How do I get to the product images? That now resides at design time, meaning I have to look at this specification to see, oh, okay, here's how I update it. Here's how I get the images and whether I wanna to decide to do this or not. All of this has to be cited at design time when you're actually creating your client. So if we take that idea of being able to provide to the client and kind of shifting, so we're not so design time heavy, but moving a little bit to runtime, that means that we're gonna provide our client, our spa, uh, with information about things that it can actually do. So if we're looking at this particular price situation here, I have some actions that you can do. If we look at my open API spec, you can see that I have the ability to decrease the price, get the product information, uh, set it as available, set it as unavailable, and increase the price. Now, the thing is, is that these two particular um, operations, I'm not gonna be able to set the price available if it's already available. Why would I let the user do that? That doesn't make sense. I'm only gonna let them make it available if it's unavailable. And I'm only gonna make it, let them set it as unavailable if it's currently available. Or maybe there's different business uh, rules related to when you can mark something as available. So at design time, what we're doing is we're looking and we're seeing, okay, these are all the operations that are available, but that it doesn't mean that they're all available all the time. So if I look at the this particular route to get the actual product, ABC123, it'll execute this. Now what my server's doing is it's telling me what are the relevant actions that you can actually can perform. And right now, at the current state, based off maybe the state and my user and whether I have permissions, I can increase the price, I can decrease the price, and because the product is already available, the only other option I have is to make it unavailable. So in my UI, what I can do is when I receive that response from the server, I'm looking at this response to see, okay, is there this action can I, do I have unavailable for sale? If I do, then I can particularly just show this element in my UI, like this, this option. And because I don't have uh, of it marking it as available for sale, I don't allow the user to have that option. So right now, if I set as unavailable, what I've done is I've made the call to that particular route. Now, if I run this request again, We can see that because I've marked it unavailable, now it's not for sale. And now on the reverse side, now I have this particular action available for sale, which now my UI in turn has changed so that I can mark it as available. So let's do that again. Now, like I said, there's other, biz there's other uh, business rules that could be applicable. It might just not be on that, but we don't have any of that logic in our client anymore of determining how or when based off the results that we get we're not implying anything. We're not deciding, oh, this is the data. This is what I can do or not do. All of a sudden, if the server decides, well, you know what? If you have no quantity on hand, then you can't make a product available. So what I'm gonna do is I'm doing an inventory adjustment. We have 25, so I'm gonna remove all 25. And then now my product is unavailable because behind the scenes what happened is that product got, we don't have any quantity on hand in, anymore. So it automatically set it to being unavailable, which means now I have no option of making it available or unavailable because we have no quantity. Again, business rules define this. All of this now has lived in the server and it's telling the client what actions you can perform. 
So if I execute this again, we can see that I only have increase and decrease price because none of the other actions are relevant based off state anymore. So to illustrate this in code, here's the HTML that I have. It's just pretty simple for that dropdown to increase, decrease the price, and then setting as available and unavailable. And I just have some IDs. Then in my vanilla JavaScript, what I'm doing is I'm making the HTTP call via fetch. I'm getting the response out. And then what I'm doing is I'm looking at that response to see, okay, in the actions array, is there an item with a name that is unavailable for sale? Then I'm basically taking that DOM element and I'm saying, okay, if it, that link exists, that action exists, then show it. If not, don't show it. And then subsequently what I'm also doing is I'm adding the actual uh, href property, which was the URI, I'm attaching it to that item because when I subsequently click it and I want to actually make the HTTP call, I have what the actual URI is. I don't need to construct the URI because the server gave it to me. So what this means is we're moving a little bit more to runtime and we're using the information at runtime that the server is giving us to build out our UI. So this isn't completely generic like a browser and HTML are. You still need that design time. You still need that open API spec to show what the request body is, for example. I'm not including any of that like a form, but you're moving things over to understand that if the response comes back and it contains an action or a link, then that is explicitly telling me that I can do something. And in your client, then you're gonna make conditional um, statements at design time to show oh, this particular action exists, maybe I wanna show this particular UI element, maybe I don't. Again, you're making things much more explicit in a uniform way to tell the client what they can and cannot do. So we've been doing this forever. It's called hypermedia. And as you can see, when I've been describing with HTML, things like images, links, forms, the server's providing HTML to the browser, which is the client, which understands what to do with those uh, capabilities. But somehow we lost our way and didn't do this at all when we started developing HTTP APIs. There's various media types that support what I'm referring to in different ways. There's JSON API, Hydra, Siren, HAL, and many others that I'll have links in the description. If you want your clients to be smarter, you need to have the server tell them explicitly via the response what they can and cannot do, and that will be based on state. There's a lot of benefits to hypermedia that I haven't described in this video, but I plan to soon, so make sure to subscribe. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks.